Hello, everybody, and welcome to One Day Today. We are on episode 53. I'm really excited about our guest today. Um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation that we're going to be having. Uh, well, this is this is a virtual stage. I know you've all seen this and been here before, but this the reason that we're here is, you know, in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of everything going on in the world, you know, there's there's there are a lot of conversations of separateness and division. But at the same time, despite that, amidst that, there's people doing amazing, beautiful work, people who focus on the beauty in the world, focus on something greater than themselves. And that's really what this space is for, is for, for you and I and all of your neighbors, all of my neighbors, to share your gifts, to share your genius. There's, a, there's just so much beauty in my, in my experience. Every day that I, ha I host this stage, I always learn something. There's always a new perspective. There's always a new circumstance, a new way of life or way of being that people bring that opens up my heart, opens up my mind to really see something that I w wasn't even possible to see before. And I'm, I'm really excited. This is, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to introduce him right now and let him have at it. But I'd like to introduce you to our guest, Michael Austin. Michael, thank you for joining us today. Great to have you. Thank you very much. Mr. Abrams, Sickle Rivers. <laughs> so you can see me okay, right? I see you just fine. <clears throat> Hear you loud okay. and clear. I can too. Excellent. Well, Thank you for inviting me, dude. Absolutely. Um, we were just talking before, and I'm really excited uh, to hear you share your piece and your story. So I'm just going to let you have at it if you're all right with that. Sound good? Sure. All right. <clears throat> sure. Michael, the stage is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. Abram met me through a mutual friend. Um, virtual meeting, if you will. And our mutual friend is amazing. Her name is Randy. Randy found me on LinkedIn. I know how she found Abram, but Randy's very fine. Randy finds unusual people. <clears throat> so Randy found me a few years ago and said, so you got a book in you? And I'm, you know, making the conversation shorter. I said, probably. And she coached me on <clears throat> what I could do with the book. Uh, gave me, you know, good author's agent advice, which I'm grateful for. And I'm not quite ready with the book yet because I didn't know what the book was going to be. And Abram said a few minutes ago, a poem they wrote, wrote him. He didn't write the poem. The poem wrote him. It's kind of like that, you know. And one of the early uh, versions of some writing I did for the book, somebody said to me, there's not enough of you in there. Well, I need to be ready to do that. And so this is maybe a preamble to that, if you will, a real life preamble. <clears throat> so, I'd been in the closet about my skills and abilities for a long time because I didn't know who to talk to about them. And found teachers in my mid 20s who could help me uh, Rosen for a year, um, healers, psychics, yada yada. And I needed lots of frames of reference and uh, who I was going to be and who I wasn't. And I can think of many occasions which were um, mile markers along that journey. Then around 1980, I met a guy I saw on TV, on national TV, who had taken teams of psychics and found people and things, and, and a very angel guy. And he had good methods, and I got to know him. And that's right before I graduated from uni university. And at first, when I got into university, I was going to be doing environmental studies. Because I love the idea of science, and I was thinking about doing a bachelor's in biology, and I was thinking about teaching, and I switched gears because I met somebody who was, uh, what's the word, <clears throat> uh, an unexpected coach. Maggie had a master's in chemistry and switched to religious studies, which is what I did. I had a bachelor's, a bachelor's to be, and I switched to religious studies, and it happened fairly quick. And... That changed the arc of my life. My senior research paper was about the symbolism of ascension and flying in classical yoga traditions, which was really a thinly veiled study of meditation. I was going to talk about that at you know, State University. You can't be careful about that. But still, my teacher was a really good guy. <clears throat> at that point, he had a young daughter. So he was my coach on some of my stuff, and I wrote papers for him about things including uh, – uh, Levitation in yoga traditions, but I also wrote about biblical traditions and 
one of my favorite papers that I've lost track of is, was about hobby horses. Okay. So I was interested in really esoteric, very practical stuff. And it took me a long time to be willing to experience and or express my gifts. Gifts meaning what I showed up with, but I had to be willing to use them. And I had to find um, personal and societal containers, acceptable ways to express them. Okay. And those abilities that I have are sometimes called cities, S-I-D-D-H-I-S. You can see them in the Yoga Sutras. Those things are also present in other traditions, including Buddhism. They call them by different names. Uh, shamanism. Even in Christianity, you find weird guys that do unusual stuff. Okay, but in Western culture, it's tend to be tends to be uh, what's the word repressed. Okay, because nobody knows knows what to do with something unless a mainstream scientist can explain it to you. So, beginning when I started meditating, I was seeing things coming that were 19, 20 years away. I didn't know what they were. And I didn't know until I got there. Or I was seeing things coming that were three weeks away. Um. There's lots of stories about that that I have. Um, one of the better early examples is I'm meditating one day, and my teachers said at that point, and I was on my own, I'm still going to college, university, don't meditate past a certain period of time. It's a very bad thing. You know, it will hurt you. And I have this maverick attitude, like, who are you? Excuse me. Uh, I'm going to do what I want. <clears throat> so I sat there meditating a long time, and I'm in the groove, and all of a sudden, I get this image of a gorilla right here, and it scared the hell out of me. And my heart rate tripled, doubled, whatever it is, went breathing really fast. Now, I've had many wild animals on my hands. I've never interacted with a gorilla, you know, tamer in a zoo. So that scared the hell out of me. Um, but I thought, well, what was that? And it was really clear. And the gorilla was benign. It was like, yeah. Hi, here I'm a gorilla. We're hanging out. And around two and a half or three weeks later, I am looking in the phone book for part-time jobs because I'm an undergraduate. I'm trying to make some money. It's pocket money, right? And I hadn't planned any of this. I just looked on the phone book, the yellow pages. <clears throat> and I see this place called Belinograms. And I'm like, singing telegrams. That would be so much fun. I got to try that. So I call up this place, it's in Santa Barbara. So I remember the corner where it was. It was an inside mall, that was a big deal back then. Inside malls were a big deal back then. And her name's Joanne, we get along right away. She hires me on the spot. And my first delivery was in um, uh, a gorilla suit. Now, the potential skeptics will say among you, well, that's not possible. Well, I know it is from long experiences. And I found that the most important thing about what you experience, what I experience is I got to trust it and I got to believe it's real because it was real. And you don't need a science to tell you something is real. You don't need a teacher to tell you something's real. It's real or it's not. You got to learn how to trust that. And that was the main first takeaway I got from this. And there are many other occasions I've got about this. So what I wanted to explore today was learning how to trust one's own intuition and to know what that looks like and to know when it's accurate, to know when it's inaccurate. And most people who are well known for what they do have really strong aspects of intuition. I don't want to necessarily call it that. I have a new friend I've been, been talking with now for six months who uh, dropped a nugget a couple of days ago. Oh, yeah, I this a dream. My whole family is a dream. Excuse me, I don't lose a dream. I do it in different states. Um, so in order for me to move forward with my life, I had to be willing and open to those things because they would sometimes make people nervous. And sometimes I would see, think, see something coming or see somebody coming. I don't know who they are. I literally see them, sometimes feel them. Uh, these days, <clears throat> it's not uncommon that if they're going to show up and they're going to be important to me, I'll see them in a dream or a meditation beforehand. But I'm going to focus on it because it's not real till they show up. Everyone makes choices. Everyone makes choices. I'm going to see this thing or I'm not going to see this thing. 
So I had to hang around scientists for a little bit, <clears throat> including my teachers, um, to show me through their science to reassure me that I was not a freak. And the fact is, there are a lot of freaks like me. Ha ha. <clears throat> Um, it's just that it's not well um, understood by popular culture. But there are people like me that used their talents for the U.S. government. There are people like me that use their talents at business. And the businesses I founded, and, and most of which are still running, are all about, I had a hunch about something. And I said, I'm going to do that. In fact, I had one of those kind of hunches about six years ago. I said I'm going to start to myself a financial fund based on remote viewing. This is basically clairvoyance. And my intellect said, you're nuts. <laughs> my intuition said, no, there's something to it. Well, I did that. Okay, It's still running. Um, <clears throat> we know people around the planet who do this. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work like anything else. And my groove these days is just talk about more about who I am. And like Abram is doing with this community, find out the amazing stories about how people express who they are, because there's a lot of them. And those stories inspire other people. So some of the stuff that I do um, is in stealth mode, meaning some of the companies, let's see, one, two of them right now, uh, two will become public pretty quick. Uh, one looks like it's going to be giant. Uh, another is, you know, more modest. But they're all based on my own perceptions of a Gaia consciousness, meaning how I move on the earth, who I've been, who I've not, who we've been as a species on the earth, who we've been not been as a species. And I've got a whole bunch of experience and knowledge I've built up in this body about that. And I take my information from a lot of sources. A lot of sources. Uh, some people you've heard of, some people you haven't. One of my sources lately is Graham Hancock. In one of his books, Thor Heyerdahl, who was the guy that built the Contiki reed boat and sailed around the world in a thing, said to him, oh, yeah, we're at least three million years old on the planet. Whoa, I didn't know that. No, I trust Hancock's work, and I trust the other data I've assembled about that. So I'm, I, I'm going with that, right? And I'm looking at, well, how do I know that? So that's all really very interesting for me. <clears throat> um, what could I say that would be fascinating and or amusing? Oh, this one. <clears throat> Russell Targ is a friend of mine. Um, good guy. He's the end of his run in this body. And he will tell you, we say, he says, physicists and scientists say, and I know at least two guys that would say this and agree with him, that your... Um, experience, for example, of walking out in the morning to get the paper at the news, the newspaper at the curbside. I know it's an old thing, just go with it, okay? And you walk out of your bathroom, you get it, get the paper, and you see an orange Volkswagen bug. It's like unusual for you, because there's not normally an orange Volkswagen bug parked there. He would say your experience of that causes your pre-sentiment or precognitive awareness of that event. Now, that is a real melon twister for me. That's like, Wait, what? And I trust it because of him. So I've got my own teachers and mentors, if you will, who will tell me little nuggets like that. Because I've always been really curious and I want to know why something happens. I've been asking people for around 40 years off and on how it's even possible to have precognition or clairvoyance or levitation or whatever else people do. Everybody's got their own gifts, right? <clears throat> and nobody's got a real good answer yet. I'm not sure we ever will. I would imagine most of those answers are from the East, meaning Asia, okay, the Orient, Indian traditions. Um, so that is um, an area of continual learning and surrender for me. This takes a lot of surrender. What you think is supposed to happen and what actually happens are two different things. I should stop talking. <clears throat> I feel like, I feel like, I don't know. Abram, help me out here, dude. Tell me something you want to hear about. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for, for sharing all of that. I, uh, there's so many things that come to mind that you were sharing. Like, first, I just appreciate you sharing your, you know, your, 
just how you came he, to be here. And I, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, just between the bridge in West and East, it, specifically when you were talking about like how, this is like, I was raised in a secular family in, in secular California. And there's a lot of, like, I had no concept of spirituality or religion or any, even, I mean, I, other than an outsider looking in, I had, or a friend who went to Catholic school, I really had no spiritual practice other than celebrating Hanukkah because my dad, my dad's Jewish, but I was never really religious about it. But, but I totally get what you were saying is that, you know, most in Western society, unless a scientist in a, la a white lab coat has said that this is happening because of this, and here's the proof, we don't even open our ears to it, including myself for mo most of my life. And what do you see is the bridge between those worlds? Because this world is becoming more interconnected. But how, how do you see those two worlds it, being? It was always that way. We just didn't notice it. It's been that way for a, as long as anybody can remember. Um, and there's an old Hindu proverb I'm fond of in the front of an old book called Holy Round, W-H-O-L-L-Y, uh, by somebody who ran the Bay Area. And it says, what is here is elsewhere and what is not here is nowhere which means everything is connected and always was. And when you think about that, that's, that's what, what? That means that you affect somebody in The uh, Hague or you affect somebody in China and they affect you and in subtle ways. <clears throat> so Jessica Utz is a retired professor of statistics at UC Irvine. And once upon a time, she was, um, one of the people who examined the former government Stargate program, the, the military hired psychics, actually they conscripted psychics, they said, you come with us, and they did. And they got actual intelligence information from them. So Jessica was hired to examine the data from that. She said, yep, it's real, it worked. <clears throat> and she's presenting in front of the American Statistical Association a few years ago. And the audience is said to be something like six or 7,000 people. And the science about this is proven. It's been proven over uh, 60, 70 years. It's already there. Okay. And I meaning you can look at the studies and yep, there's an effect there. It worked, whatever the effect size was. And at the same time, most of the people in the audience weren't on the same page as her. And she said to them straight out, look, the science is incontrovertible. What's gonna change your appreciation of it? And everybody said a single personal experience of something that's unusual. Well, that makes it simple. It's about what you perceive. Is it real or is it not? And, and that is, everybody's the same way. Everybody in the planet's the same way. Mm. And I've talked to uh, rocket scientists. I've talked to many kinds of people. Same way. <clears throat> so one of my favorite bits that Dean Radin quotes in one of his books, Dean's a personal, personal and business friend. And he's really good at shagging down facts that are really useful. And he says in Entangled Minds, and I forget the page number, he says, do you realize that when physicists talk and biologists talk about how much they know about the universe, they know exactly 0.4% of the universe. 3.6% is interstellar gas and dust. Everything else is dark matter and dark energy, which means they don't know what it is. They have no idea. Well, they've got ideas now, but they're not clear. Right. And so 70 some percent is, is dark matter and dark energy. And there's only a few people who know how to start talking about that and start talking about it and start talking about it. One is this woman who is at Yale, Cosmologist, smart woman. I saw her speak. I read her book called Mapping the Heavens. But she's not a woo-woo friend, a woo-woo scientist, right? She's all about what can we show. <clears throat> so when somebody says to me it can't be true, I go, well, how do you know that? Okay. And you have to leave it up to them to use their own filters. And you have to leave it up to them to decide what they saw was true or not. And that comes down to self-trust and self-love. I know it sounds like a platitude, but in fact, it's true. There it is, guys. So, absolutely, that yeah. No, that that's that's exactly. I, I totally get your point. Um, you know, and that that's something that I've seen, that I've discovered. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he's an author, Dan Clark. He's a 
one of the uh, co-writers of uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. And I was talking to him and he was kind of pointing me to something that I discovered, but I hadn't put the words, you know, and it's like, it's progress in humanity. You know, there's science and, you know, science has a huge role in what we see the universe and the, mat the material the universe is made of and what, you know, what, what we perceive and what's happening in our, in our, in our synapses in our brain and what's hap what's the material of the outside world. And it, but it is, it's not the knowledge of science that leads to progress in humanity. It is through art and music that humans actually discover that experience that you're just, it, it is the experience of wonder, of joy, of beauty that we can't even put to words. It's just like this, it, it's something magical that we can't even explain other than an experience of this feeling of something outside of ourselves, but at the same time inside ourselves. And that's, and I, and he was just kind of pointing me to, it's like, it is not left or right brain. It is, it is human progress is through an amalgamation of left and right brain, you know, and that's, and that is expressed through creative expression in art. And that's really what, you know, what we're doing in this movement is sharing people's expression in their own, in their own unique way. And um, one thing I wanted to turn to just kind of tying it together, what you were speaking, oh, we had a question actually from our friend Randy, but we were asking about intuition. I'm gonna pull up her question here. She would love to hear more about how to trust one intuition. And I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Like, how does one, you know, with the, what we were just speaking of, how does one experience and trust and distinguish one's own intuition from our ego, from our, you know, our shadow, from our flat, whatever, whatever spiritual or distinction or psychological distinction we use to describe the other voice? Develop a practice that works for you, that calms you down and gets you out of your head. <clears throat> and for me, that one of those first practices was being outside when I was a kid. Mm. My parents were <clears throat> campers and walkers. My dad was a hunter a long time ago. Uh, my mother grew up on a mountain south of our town. She grew up as a tomboy. So <clears throat> I would go off on my own and sometimes with them and walk and hang out with animals okay and that automatically gave me presets to get out of my head because thinking tends to diminish intuition thinking meaning i'm going to think this through i'm going to be careful about that and the practice can be bicycling the practice can be meditation meditation definitely helps and, and meditation would be different for different people. When I first started doing my kind of meditation I started with, people said to me, I can't do that. I just, I can't sit. Well, you're fine. Do something that works for you. As an example, something that worked for me was bicycling. Um, I had, and road bikes is what I liked. Okay. I had these things called rollers, which is basically um, a controlled gyroscope, put the bicycle on top of it, and you got to stay upright and you got to pay attention. It, it disconnects your mind, so you have to focus on the, the, the stand upright. <clears throat> and in that process, my intuition gets stronger. Okay. Examples like that running is really good. Anything where you're cross crawling and doing this with your hands and arms is very, very good because we're wired that way to have hemispherical integration. And that's what the meditation does. It has your two, it does other things too. You don't want to oversimplify this. It has your two brain hemispheres talk and get, get used to each other. Like, hi, how you doing? You know, <laughs> let's talk. I hear you know about this, right? Um, and the third aspect of that would be practice. Keep doing that thing. And if it stops working for you, get something else. Okay, because it changes. And, and maybe it's going to be... <clears throat> Maybe it's going to be something that changes you didn't expect, and you want that. You want to get out of yourself and sit in no thought, no feeling, nowhere, be no one, in no time. And it's strange as it sounds, that connects you with everything and everyone. When you surrender your identity is when you start to get happier. When you surrender your identity, you realize you're unique. And that's just this 
silly conundrums. Like, wait, what? So that there are plenty of teachers here in the West doing that now in different ways. You know, it's funny. I don't remember talking with Randy exactly about intuition, but but uh, I would see her as um, an especially intuitive sort. Okay, whether or not she sees it that way, she's also really smart. But, but. so, what else, Randy? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's that's powerful. You know, I, as someone who's uh, spent most of my life as a chronic overthinker, you know, I, I've seen I've seen the power of how into I've seen the power of intuition, but I've also seen the power of the mind's ability to interrupt in intuition. You know, when I I will mistake the thought patterns in my like well, working for on a song, for example, I'll be inspired, I'll be in the depths of this feeling, this deep yearning of like expression and and i'll be on the keyboard and i'll be just just letting it out and it feels great and i just feel like one with the universe and then like sneaking in i'll have a thought pattern and be like this doesn't sound as good as the beatles this doesn't sound as good as bob dylan and I'll, like I'll, I'll like a judging voice or a critiquing voice will, will come in and say well why couldn't it do this instead of that or why doesn't it do that i'll focus on what it isn't i'll focus on what it's not and without even realizing it, get my intuition is just deflated because I've completely interrupted and disrupted that natural flow. What, what, what you're doing there, which you already know, is you're editing yourself and you're creating. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. Just supposed to spill it out, okay? Right. And, and then once it's spilled out, you go, oh, look at that thing. That's so cool. Maybe I could like polish it up a little bit, okay? Um, and, and that's the way it's supposed to work. It's supposed to come from places beyond your usual comprehension. And that's your, that's everybody's real skill mm -hmm. because everybody sees things differently. You're supposed to. Okay. Right. And even when you're pissed off at them, you're supposed to see things differently. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> What has worked for me is <clears throat> what started working for me is sitting meditation because I was really ampy and couldn't sit. Okay. And um, physical exercise helps people, whatever that is, or stretching helps people to be able to sit, just sit mm -hmm. and practice not thinking. And the bits of me that are judgmental, <clears throat> I treat them like a little child, little boy. Say, thank you for showing that to me, son. Please go have a seat and hang on for a while. I give him something to do, okay? Right. You know, here's a TV program. Here's a book to read, okay? Uh, have you looked at that cool lizard yet? Okay. <clears throat> and that works really well for me. I use things from my own experience, and I give my um, child mind permission to play on its own. Well, my adult mind is working with itself. And to my extreme surprise over many, many years, <clears throat> I, 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 when two guys measured my EEGs, I, I, was, I didn't want people to measure them. I went, no, nah, I don't want that. Because I was nervous about it. Because I felt like I'd be, be under my hood looking at my engine. I didn't want that, right? <clears throat> so I eventually relented. And both of them are neuroscientists. One was in 2016 and one was in 2017, I think. And both different guys, different areas. Um, and they hooked me up. And I found out some surprising things about how I've taught myself to run my mind. Now, my mind is not only in between my ears. I should mention that for people. Your mind is throughout your body and in your field. Your field and your awareness and your consciousness precedes your body. That comes first. Just trust that for a while and play with that. What that means is this meat suit we're walking around in, this meat sack, is secondary. Okay? Yeah, it's really handy. We love being here, but it's secondary. Um, and I found out, for example, one guy said, did you know that you produce a theta and alpha peak at 7.8 hertz? I went, no. Well, I knew already that 7.8 hertz is a base Schumann resonance frequency. That is the frequency of energy that bounces between the Earth's crust 
and the upper atmosphere. And there's graduates of that. If you're a musician, you would get, you know, harmonics with that. And I don't know all the harmonics. And I got friends of mine, probably a couple are listening today, watching today, that know about that. And they, they track Schumann resonances. And <clears throat> what I taught myself there was to communicate with the earth. Mm. And I went, oh, okay. Didn't see that one coming. And I found that one out in a lab here at a local university. It's a quiet Sunday. I'm hanging out with this guy. Um, he is currently sans body. He was amazing, but he's currently not got a body. Um, the other one was this guy who's much more um, Western minded, but still he's a sleeper and you can't really tell what he's thinking until he opens his mouth. Okay. Let's see. He's going to take the harder. And he said, um, so your EEG scans match those of uh, a study, a research that I did of 60 known healers. Would you say you're a healer? And I felt found out and vindicated at the same time. It was really a curious feeling. So I don't tell anybody about this, right? So um, <clears throat> those, for me, all of those experiences came about because in my case, I was unwilling to do, no, I think about it, unwilling to do what other people told me to do. And, and I have many characteristics of an only child or the oldest child in the family, although I have two siblings, but they're six, eight years older than me, okay? Now, I, I find out I accumulated stuff over time. So what that means is I have this person that I like, oh, I'm going to do what I want to do, and that stuck. At the same time, in my 20s, I felt like such a freak. <clears throat> And a little bit in my 30s, I didn't talk to anybody about my experiences. And I was, like I'd said to you, I was trying to be somebody I wasn't. Well, maybe I wanted fast cars. You know, maybe I wanted a lot of money. But I always wanted my own self. And it wasn't until about 15 years ago I started returning to who I thought I could be. Because my son's mom, although she was intuitive herself, I made her nervous. Okay. I just made her nervous because I'd see things coming. <clears throat> that's in business. That's personally. Um, so <clears throat> what I love talking to people about is their own versions of how they came to awareness. And my favorite question for the last, let's see, coming up on two years is, would you please share with me your single most scientifically inexplicable experience in your life. So, Mr. Abram, do you feel like answering that? Not that you have to. Say, ask me again. I scientifically <clears throat> the single most scientifically inexplicable experience of your life. So I'll give you an example. Inexplicable. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I'm sitting and meditating, and I'm maybe. Let me think. 20. <clears throat> I'll do a better one because this is up at my page on Facebook called Non Local Consciousness. I've got a video there that I posted under a pseudonym before I was got more comfortable about what I did. And it's about shortcuts in time and space. I told you about the moth story hour. And I woke up one morning and I'm maybe 19 or 20. And I had a precognitive, a clairvoyant dream about somebody I was very fond of. <clears throat> and this girl that I grew up with, hometown, uh, I had talked to her about briefly about four years before that. But I crushed on her for a long time when I was a kid. She's gorgeous, right? So what happened is she got married uh, when she was 16. She had her, her parents' permission. Her dad was a doctor. She was well-known in town, right? Went across the pond and became a meditation teacher. And then I wake up four years later, and I know she's back in town. I went, wait a minute, what the fuck was that? Okay. <laughs> and I knew she had three kids and I hadn't talked to her in 10 years, you know, significantly. Okay. I, I, mean, I hadn't called her house in maybe 10 years. <clears throat> so I called her house. A uh, woman answers the phone. Is Celine there? Pause, pause, beep, beep. How'd you know she was here? I lied. A friend told me. How am I going to tell her? And I get Celine on the phone. 
And who's this? Oh, it's Mike Dill, because that my, was my name at birth, right? I changed it in my 20s. She goes, oh, cool. How'd you know I was here? I said, I dreamed it. She was totally fine with it, okay? Went and talked on the beach. So I have things like that happen for me. They're not always in dreams. Sometimes they're in, in, in waking consciousness. And something, something will occur to me, go, what was that? Wait, who? Or I'll see somebody. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's tricky to switch channels when you're processing audio. It's like watching TV, you need picture in picture. Or when you're processing visuals, you need to reduce the, the, uh, uh, the audio signal a little bit so you can focus on one thing. Otherwise, right. it, that's me, right? So <clears throat> that's taken a lot of fine tuning over many years. And I find that other people that do this are very similar. Uh, one of my favorite recent stories is Shamani Jane, who I interviewed on my, my uh, show, Casual Saints, is amazing. <clears throat> and um, she tells a story on her show about, uh, on my show, about how her teacher manifested something for her, okay? And she is very, a sort of very present individual. She's the uh, founders of the Consciousness and the Healing Initiative. And I found out from her, she said, a lot of us that do creative stuff are very musical, which you will love hearing, okay? And I've seen her covering um, White Rabbit on stage live, okay? And she was amazing. It's like, she's been doing all her life. Well, the reason she can do that is she drops out of who she is and who she can be. It's just what you're doing with your music. And that's my favorite place to live. And it also makes me nervous sometimes. And I go, wait, wait, do I really want to do that? Am I going to know what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. And that sometimes makes me nuts. Okay. But I'm supposed to do it that way. Okay. So, so I can count, I can start enumerating an endless list of those things. Okay. Endless about where yeah. somebody got my attention about something including coming to the Bay Area, <clears throat> including my girlfriend, including us going to Egypt, all these astounding things that go on because I just surrender to who I'm supposed to be and let other people be who they're supposed to be at the same time. And that can be really scary, you know? Probably, I don't know, <clears throat> two-thirds of the people listening to us now, you know, whatever time they're listening to us, are pretty good at being who they're supposed to be. But mm -hmm. I figure, and they've already they're figuring that out, right? I figure that one of the main potentials of your program and your movement is you're going to find people that don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. And you'll get to, to, by the very nature of your platform, you get to draw them out. And that's the people you really need because you don't want people listening to but that's people in addition to those who need those people. You don't have people listening to mass media. Not a good idea. That's mm -hmm. a, a it's a mental diet of junk food. That's like eating Twinkies and popcorn and, and uh, corn chips all day with, with no veggies and no stuff that really nourishes you, right? Right. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to hang with you. It's like, yeah, let's talk because I would have done this with you <clears throat> even 10 years ago. But, you know, I let things change for me. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Well I, well, I definitely appreciate that, everything you're saying. I mean, that that just goes back to what just what you're saying about intuition. Like, there's so like there's not one miraculous event like you're describing where I, I could recall every detail. But there's so many situations where I would, like, where I would think of somebody and they would call not even a breath later. Or, like, or like I would... That, that happens. Oh, that not miraculous though? That's yeah. miraculous. No, it, no it's, well, what I was meaning is it's not like a full story where I knew all the details. I mean, that's happened many times in my life, like even recently, where I've just thought of somebody and mm -hmm. they were, then all of a sudden they were there. And it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I guess that's what question will kind of come to the mind is, you know, the power of our word is, you know, like our out of our words and language 
reality rises. You know, like our experience of reality comes <clears throat> forward. Where does intuition and our word come connect? Like, where are they connected? Because our words are powerful. We can manifest. We can visualize. Our words are powerful, especially when we we stand in that space. Stand in the like stand at the end of our vision is what brings it to us. So I, I feel intuition is receiving, and word is kind of giving. And where where what's the dance between those two? How many lifetimes you got to talk? Okay. Um, <clears throat> that is in every strong tradition on the planet, including Kabbalah, which I know nothing about. Okay. Um, in East Indian traditions, meaning Asian traditions like that, they will give you mantras that are meant to uh, re-energize or strengthen certain of your energy centers in your body. And the reason they do that is from ancient practices, because certain sounds do certain things to you. And you can find this in pop culture. <clears throat> the Moody Blues, a long time ago, one of the bands I listened to, it was my first album as a kid, right? One of those guys said, by the way, did you know that when you record a certain frequency in a certain song, you play it backwards, you can stimulate your body, right? No, I didn't know that. Um, Vedic traditions, and I'm sketchy on some of the details, but all of those Indian traditions practiced over probably for my money millions of years, okay, um, came because people noticed how we interact with form and matter. And by speaking, and, and also American Indian traditions too, the Navajo come to mind. Um, the Navajo have this world word called Hosho. And if anybody looks it up, you know, I'm probably not saying it right, but spelling I, I knew was H-O-X-C-O or something like that. And it means walking in a beauty way. Okay. And some of those traditions didn't, didn't even have a word for art, but they just did art. So back to, to, to speech. Graham Hancock will tell you in his writing that most of the written Indian traditions were never written at first. They were carried orally, oral traditions. Okay. Shumash, Indians did it that same way. And they really, in their case, don't have any writings. In fact, there's a book called December's Child by, I think his name is Blackburn. It's very good about the oral traditions of the Shumash. So we're wired and built and naturally set up to tune ourselves to words and sounds. That doesn't mean we do only that. We're also wired to notice movement. We're wired to notice change. We're wired to notice entropy. And entropy is change. It's a measurement of change. So <clears throat> words can work really well for me. And I get a lot of stuff in my awareness that way. I listen to audio books instead of reading them. Because I won't sit in time to take time to read it because I feel like I'm taking away time, time from something else. And that, that upsets me. And I feel ashamed when I do that. So I don't do it. But audiobooks, I'll listen to those when I'm resting or when I'm taking a drive. And they, they get me out of myself. Um, when I say audiobooks, Peter Pan, 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, there's a bunch of stuff I listen to. It's all across the map. And I haven't made music in a long time, but I have an affinity for what you do. And once upon a time, I wanted to do it a lot. <clears throat> like I had a garage band, you know, get ready for covers and stuff like that. We didn't, we didn't actually do that. But I set up an old house that I had back in my 20s with a soundproof garage to, to, you know, to do words, to sound. And it was such a rush. And to this day, when I sing and I'm in the right mood, I will see colors. I will, um, it's a way to activate your body centers and a way to say, hello heart, um, hello third eye, uh, hello second chakra, hello feet, whatever you wanna do. So when you're playing your music or when you're composing it, you're doing that. And and I've always had a big respect for people who are musicians because they check in with the cosmos and they check in with the infinite. And they check in with the, the lapses in time and space. 
where everything comes from. So back to word for a second. <clears throat> the um, Hindu tradition would say, the universe came into being when um, Purusha somehow connected mysteriously with Prakriti, okay? And that means um, form and f form and formlessness. Okay, you can look it up, right? People can look this up. And it's very vague, okay? But it comes from a place of nowhere, no thing, no definition. Um, and, and I've always been fond of that. So I use all those things, as strange as it might sound, when I'm starting companies. And when I, when I um, find people to work with. And it's like a beacon, dude. It's like when you, when you, do, when you say what you want and you do who you are, people just show up. You're like, wait, who are you? Oh, thank you. That's so cool. And sure, I'd like to talk about that. And what would you like to do? And, you know, and like that. And it makes it a much more collaborative process. And collaboration is so much more fun because you get stuff you didn't have by yourself. Okay. And, and each of us, Bruce Lipton says, he's, he calls us imaginal selves, cultural creators, right? Each of us has our own expression of reality, and there's 7.8 billion of those, not including discarnates. So that's a lot of people doing a lot of things. We all need each other, and we all want to find out what the connection is. And I've got friends in India, <clears throat> good friends. I've got friends on several continents, some of whom I never met. Mm -hmm. And they all do words and they all do concepts. A few of them do music. Mm -hmm. So um, there's this great, <clears throat> it's a Facebook page, and I remember the name of the thing. The guy that started it, I think it's a guy, posts clever Chinese paintings in old style. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, guys, old women, sometimes young. And one of my favorites is most of speech is so reductionist yeah. that it's almost like pointing at the moon and trying to describe it. It's like, wait, how do you describe that thing? Okay. How many words does it, does it take instead of just looking at it and having a direct experience of it? That's something I should mention just to help it. <clears throat> There's this concept in Hindu thought, called, Hindu thought called direct perception. And I think the um, name of it was Sakshat Karana, Karanya. I've got a paper about this, if anybody cares to look up, it's on academia.edu. Um, a numbers woman in India, a CPA asked me to ask to see it. So I just put it up on the web. It's from 1982, it's called The Symbolism of Ascension and Flight in classical yoga traditions, the symbolism of ascension and flight, of classical yoga traditions. And it was a scholarly academic thing, but it mentions that in there. And this is back when I was first deciding what direction I wanted to take. <clears throat> so you, with your music, you're doing direct perception. There's this thing you're, you're saying, here's what I see. I'm going to form it this way with my thought. I'm going to form it this way with my words and my tones and my what was your first instrument, dude? Was it guitar? Was it keyboards? Actually, it was flute. Flute? Excuse me. Okay, what, what, what else do you play now? Anything? Uh, well, primarily guitar, singing, play some piano and keyboards, do production, flute, and a saxophone were my first instruments growing up. Ooh. Well, that gives you a really wide variety of ways to create. Mm. And my girlfriend sounds that same way. The guy's a dubstep producer, but he also plays sitar and sax. Excuse me? <laughs> awesome. And, you know, yeah, and, and, and he, he decided that on his own. And I don't know what else he plays with me, but you, you need different modes. It would be like saying, um, how do I create um, a drawing? Okay, well, in my case, i got to describe it for somebody. Hmm. And I can say to them here, what about putting this here? What about putting that there? Somebody's an artist um, um, with a pencil or you know, some sort of a media couldn't do that right away. Or they can do it with sculptors, right? You don't have to be that way. You can do it with 
Okay, but I got to mention a book. <clears throat> Important book. <clears throat> Big Magic is the name of the book. Elizabeth Gilbert. Elizabeth is amazing. When I um, first saw publicity about her work, which was Eat, Pray, Love, I went, oh, it's a chick book, a chick movie. I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to do it. Eh. <laughs> I was wrong. Okay. And I read Big Magic, and it, it was like a beacon. Michael, read, listen to me. Read me, right? And, and she talks about living a creative life. Mm. And, and how to do it and how to not make your art suffer. You don't want to make your art suffer. She says, don't make your art pay your way. Do your art and make your art your thing that, that feeds your soul. Mm -hmm. Do that, okay? And why that works for me is she's right. Yeah. And she talks about many, many people who do art. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's ice skating. Okay, and maybe they get up at five o'clock in the morning and they talk about it. Is go to the rink. I'm going to skate. It's a thing for them, and maybe that's their art. Um, I know a variety of people who you know start companies. That's kind of artful. Okay, in a lot of ways, you have to do a lot of different stuff, and it's always a very painterly and fast process. And you hardly ever are sure we're going to get until you're done with it. Mm. And even then you're not done with it. Right. And so Big Magic is a fabulous book to encourage oneself to stop being judgmental. Just, you know, be kind to yourself, you know, wake up, you know, and, and she, I haven't met her yet. I would like to. Okay. She, you haven't read her stuff, right? Have you heard about her? I have. I said she's that's on my list. And I think just you're explaining it. I'm gonna bump it up, up my uh, my backlog because I, I actually so, have big magic. She is um, clever at describing things because she is she's trained herself as a writer, hmm. and she has inexplicable experiences in her own life. One of them there in the book in that book is with Ann Paget, this other famous writer whose work I don't know. Good. And she and Paget became buddies. And the story about this the story about this astounding, right? <clears throat> so that's that's great for you to get to read that. So or to listen. Yeah, to that. absolutely. Well, so I I I have one one more question for you, Michael. I want to this is, this is kind of tying it all back home, you know, because one day our tagline is one day is today, and it's because a lot of times when we speak we say the term one day. It's like one day I'll be happy. One day I'll follow my dreams. I'll follow my passions. But we uh, will say these words at the same time, detach any responsibility with from any said part in that future. And I wanted to ask you, what is your one day today? What that looks like for me is to imagine <clears throat> that my future is already complete mm. and already the things I want to do. Now, I don't know exact details, but I don't need to because that would be no fun. You know? <laughs> right. Uh, oh. you, you want it to be, yeah, you want it to be fun. If you know what's going to happen, it's not fun, right? Um, so that's a daily thing for me in that I'm not thinking about one day I'm going to do this. I just dove in. It's like, okay, here I am. What am I doing today about this? Right. And and where do I want it to go without stopping myself? Because mm. this culture teaches most people to stop. Sit in school, listen to your teacher, don't talk back, <clears throat> do your homework, yada, yada. Fuck that. Okay. <laughs> um, one day is being yourself today and surrendering any imagined limits that you have about yourself because the limits are they're not real they are not real okay and and, and, and you can yeah and, and people have to experience that themselves right yeah. so like when you when you when you hear you people when you know people are going to call <clears throat> that those kinds of things probably happen for you a little more than you realize but you don't see it that way mm-hmm 
which is okay. So true. Absolutely. I, I think that that's really powerful what you're saying, you know, about uh, our own limitations, about how we see what's possible. And, you know, and, and not only starting with the end in mind, but like being at the, being in that complete state, being in the, just, sta you know, standing in our essence, in our source, in our intuition is letting that guy, it's being guided by it as opposed to us trying to be in control and the illusion of control. I uh, really, really, really appreciate you being with us, Michael. You're like, I really, uh, you. I admire your spirit, your, your energy. You have such a, a fresh outlook and perspective. And I really enjoyed our conversation. I'd love for you to come back with us some more. This has been a sure. great conversation sure. for me. Thank you. Um, this is, yeah. Thank you so much, Michael. This is, uh, this has been a wonderful talk. And, real pleasure uh, to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to just check in with our listeners real quick before we, we, we end, but I just want to thank everybody for tuning in with us. Uh, this here is our, I want to invite you to share your story on our stage. One day's virtual stage is here for you to share your gift, your genius, your unique contribution is something that uplifts and enriches us all. And I want to invite you to share on our stage. This is, this is your space. It's not my space. It's your space. And that's our mission here at One Day is bringing you and me and communities together in joyous celebration, unifying humanity in our diversity, create a better world for us all. And that leads to what our One Day vision is, which is humanity rising in a connected world with each person's unique contributions being valued and magnified through a higher level of collaboration, producing unprecedented new realms of possibility. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Michael, again, for being our guest. This is another wonderful talk. We will see you on Thursday. And until then, and as, as always, one day is today. We'll see you on Thursday. Stay safe, everybody. I love you. Thanks, Travis.